1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's begin in verse 4. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and knowledge, in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this passage. Thank you for the fact that it was, it was divinely inspired by you, and you breathed on the Apostle Paul. You breathed through the Apostle Paul to write this, this amazing letter to the church of Corinth. And Lord, we know that you had plans for them regarding it. I know you have plans for us related to it. So help us, Lord, to be yielded and teachable and willing to be corrected. Help our hearts be pliable. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is our teacher. We're not interested in any word of man. We're only interested in your direct revelation, Lord, from you. So uh, help me to get out of the way, and we pray, Lord, that you would speak directly through me. Thank you, Jesus, that you're our head. You're the head of the church. Lord, we're so great, grateful that you are leading your church. We know that you said that, that the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church because you're building it. And so we, we yield to you today. We ask for a supernatural work of your spirit, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as we start this Thanksgiving, four-week Thanksgiving series, uh, we're going to be looking, as I said, four different sections that the Apostle Paul, you know, a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed um, for the different churches. And we're going to look today at being thankful for spiritual gifts. And so the title of this message is Come Short in No Gift. And so we're told in Scripture that every, every one of us has been given at least one spiritual gift. And that spirit, those spiritual gifts are critical in the mission of the church, which is to make disciples um, in, in the church. And sometimes we're, we're confused about the purpose of the church. Why do we come together as the church? What's the purpose? Um, and we can be confused about that. And there's been a lot of different models that churches have followed, some of which are not biblical, and, and then things don't go the way that God intended. Things, there's detriment that happens because people are following something that's not uh, you know, in Scripture. So it's good for us to be reminded what the purpose of the church is. It's to, it's to make disciples. I mean, beyond glorifying God, of course, that's our main purpose for existing as people and as, as the church is to glor bring God glory, of course. But in terms of the function of it in, 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 on a human level, what the purpose of it is for is to make disciples. And the, kind of the big picture, this, the life cycle, so to speak, of how God set everything up for the church to fulfill its purpose is that he's called us to go outside the church, out in the highways and byways, and preach the gospel. Then people receive Christ outside the church, and then they come into the church to be discipled and to grow into maturity to the point where they are mature enough and willing to go out into the world and to preach the gospel, and then the cycle starts all over again. Now, in that process, we can mess up that whole cycle if we're unwilling to walk in the way that God has set things up related to the, either we're unwilling to go out into the world and preach the gospel, or we're unwilling to come into the church to be discipled, or we're unwilling to grow when we're among God's people and we're, we're in church, or we're unwilling to grow in certain areas, specifically areas that touch on this whole cycle that I just articulated. So we can get in the way of that, and I know that God wants to continue to work in us all, myself included, none of us have arrived in the terms of being aligned with God's master plan, this, this cycle of perpetuation, uh, this cycle, this life cycle of the church, and, and spiritual gifts are a critical part of that cycle. Now, Jesus told the, the, the apostles at one point, freely you've received, freely give. And so often people focus on the cost within that principle, namely that there is none, 
that it doesn't cost anything to receive, it doesn't cost anything to give, instead of on the principle of receiving and giving itself, which is the main purpose of why he said it to them. Obviously, it being free, that they've freely received and that they're freely going to give it is important, and that's an aspect of what he said. But the whole main thrust of that statement is to be not just receiving, but to also be giving. And so I believe that that is something that, that God intends to militate or work against our propensity to engage in spiritual hoarding, where we hoard God's blessings and we're not letting them go out of our life to other people to the, at the same rate or even at all for some people as we are having them come into our lives. He doesn't just pour into us for us to be the final beneficiaries of those blessings. And if you read scripture and you, and, you, and you really look at it closely, you see that God pours into us so that it can go out of us to other people. That's how he set things up. Now, in our culture, our Western culture, we're very into individualism. That's something that's foreign to the rest of most of the world. The rest of the world is family-oriented and group-oriented, not individually-oriented. So they don't have any problem seeing us, like Scripture describes, as a, a larger whole who secondarily are individual members, because we are individual members. It says that. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about that we are individual members, but it also says, and the main thrust is that we're a larger whole primarily. We see ourselves primarily as individuals who secondarily happen to be part of a larger whole. But that's not anything that we're getting from Scripture. The Scripture emphasizes that we're a one body, that we're, we're one group, we're, we're a secondarily individuals, and God's always trying to work to get us to see that because we're so immersed in this whole individualism that's foreign to Scripture that it's hard for us to see that. So he's called us to freely receive and to freely give. And we think about how we receive salvation. It was free. When we think about how people poured into our hearts and, and instructed us, discipled us, was there for us. We didn't have to pay for any of that. That was all free. That was all freely from God. The first chapter of Ephesians goes on and on and on. The biggest run-on sentence in the scriptures related to all of our spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. The apostle Paul, like, I'm not even taking an, a break. I'm not even putting in a period. I'm just going to go on and on and on about all of our wealth in Jesus, all of our wealth as belie believers. And so, we have to know that, that we actually are going to be fighting against how God sees how we should exist in the, in the, in the body of Christ or just even in general in the culture to be outward. That's, that's how we have to focus and, and we have to proactively fight against that. The Christian life is a life of, of being outward, outward toward the loss and evangelism, outward toward the body of Christ, ministering and serving using spiritual gifts, outward in responding to God's love by worshiping, outward in our finances by biblically giving and being out of debt. And so there's this whole thrust that's in the scriptures that's contrary to our flesh, contrary to our culture, where we need to aggressively, outwardly, proactively be outward in terms of how our focus should be. It shouldn't be inward, it should be outward. Now there is a stewardship where we need to be good stewards of all these things, and, and, and we are, have to manage those things, of course. But the main way that we manage those things is we focus on how can I bless others with those things, with those resources. There's, there's two very important characteristics as we look at the Church of Corinth here that we need to understand that will help us related to spiritual gifts. And, and this isn't going to be an in-depth study on spiritual gifts. I'll do that another time. But the, the, the two things we need to understand when we look at the Church of Corinth here is it was one of the most carnal churches Paul ever wrote to. There's probably not a second place if you tried to think about all the, all the things that he has to say and, all, and the things that he has to bring up. Also, they were very zealous for spiritual gifts, but they had the wrong motivation. But they were zealous for spiritual gift. And, and it's interesting, once you know that, it, it, you would imagine that Paul would de-emphasize spiritual gifts, knowing how zealous they are, because they're like, okay, they're good on the spiritual gifts. I don't need to encourage them anymore in it. But that's not what he does. He encourages them in it. He fans the flame, so to speak, uh, there. And so it's easy to th throw the baby out with the bathwater and think, oh, okay, they're, they're engaged in spiritual gifts. They're, they're really zealous for it. I don't need to say anything else. But he doesn't do that. 
See, this is the key to understanding what he's getting at. The solution to gifts of the Spirit being um, you know, functioning uh, incorrectly is not less gifts. It's actually just biblical exercise of gifts. You can't separate the gifts of the Spirit from the body serving other parts of the body in order to make disciples. So we're, we're told actually in chapter 12, if we look later in the book, verses 18 through 20, Paul wrote this, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. So before these verses that I just read and after the verses I just read, he lists all kinds of spiritual gifts. He's talking about spiritual gifts and he's saying that they're not, you're not, you're all part of one body. You can't disconnect. So, so what they call body life or how, how the church functions with, within itself cannot be divorced from the use of spiritual gifts. That's how we minister to other people in the body of Christ. Whether we mention it or not, whether we identify it or not, whether we say this, this particular thing that I'm doing for somebody else falls into this category of spiritual gift, whether we do that or not, it doesn't matter. It's still being using a spiritual gift. So we can't separate those things. It's all one. I would say the key to understanding that is that your gift or gifts determine where you are set in the body. Because he's mentioned in there that each member is set and that's that's how we function is where we're god determines that he's the one that distributes gifts according to his will so he determines where we're supposed to serve in the body and he gives us commensurate gifts in order to minister those things to the rest of the body of christ so um we we, we can't disparage our gifts or other people's gifts and in chapter 12 he talked he gives examples of that um, just like your physical body can't disparage other parts of itself and have it not affect the, you know, he gives the examples of that. What if the eye can say you're not important or whatever? We, we, you know, if you have any kind of physical problem, it's really hard for you to focus on uh, doing other things with your body because you're so, you're so distracted at best and suffering at worst with this other ailment that another part of your body is dealing with. So that's kind of a brief introduction, but let's see what the Lord has for us in these verses. Paul begins this thanksgiving with, I mean, this prayer with thanksgiving for the Corinthians. Look at verse four. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus. So Paul reveals in this prayer here that he always thanked God, which is a lot to say. I always thank God. That's a lot of thanking. He was very busy thanking God and praying for them for the grace that was given to them. And I think that's a great place to start as we think about being thankful in this season is to be thankful for the grace of God because God's grace is, is limitless. We don't even know the full extent of how much we enjoy or benefit from the grace of God. You know, I often remind myself and remind others, we don't know what God spares us from on any given day. Our guardian angel or the Holy Spirit directly spares us from whatever. We don't know what, what, what is, we're spared from on any given day. So we should be thankful for the grace of God. Grace is God's unmerited or undeserved favor. And it's the only way that God can have anything to do with us because he is perfect and he is holy. He is flawless. And we are not. We are, we are sinful. And, and so anything that is less than perfect in terms of morality, God designates as sin. And, and we, don't, we want to lower the standard. We always want to lower the standard, and, and we have to never do that. The standard is the standard. It's perfection. We still fall short of perfection every single day. As a believer, we fall short. But our designation in terms of our positional standing and our positional holiness with God is based on the blood of Christ that's been applied to our account. So when God looks at us, he sees perfection in terms of our positional holiness, our positional standing with him. And that's why he can have this beautiful, wonderful relationship that he has with us and us with him. So we have to be humble about it. We have to be humble. I can't do this. I can't, I can't live this life apart from the Lord Jesus extending his grace aggressively toward my life. I remember when I lost my mom when I was 17. 
And I remember people telling me, well, she had a heart attack, and it was the day before my sister's wedding, and I was in Santa Barbara, and, you know, we were driving to a hotel, my, me and my, other, my sister, and she had a heart attack, on, and we pulled, her, pulled over on the side of the road, and we did CPR, and we flagged down a car to call an ambulance, and it was very devastating, obviously. Um, and I remember that weekend, because at the end of the weekend, I would say goodbye to her and never see her again. But I remember during that weekend, I remember my sister's friends, who are all believers, they kept telling me, the, God, the grace of God is so strong on your life right now. And it irritated me, to be honest with you, because I, I wanted some kind of credit for how I was holding up. But the fact is, I was being just completely undergirded by God's grace, and I had no idea that that was the case. And so that's, so often, that's, we don't understand how God's grace is just fortifying us and strengthening us and giving us everything that we need, and we don't necessarily know that it's God doing it directly or even indirectly. We're, we're unaware of those things. So... Now, he, he's, verse 5 here reveals what the grace was given for. Look with me at verse 5. He says, That you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge. So God gave the church of Corinth and us his grace to be enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge. And I, and I believe when he says all utterance <clears throat> and all knowledge, He's beginning to touch on their gifts, on their spiritual gifts. That's the context. And that would include the gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation of tongues, the words of knowledge, words of wisdom, prophecy, exhortation, and among others. And so I believe Paul is expressing thankfulness that God gave them grace to use these spiritual gifts. Again, they were very zealous for spiritual gifts. The problem is they were using them in a selfish way which is contrary to why God gave us the gifts. God gave us spiritual gifts to build up others. We can, we're, again, we're so self-centered. It's just crazy how self-centered we are. We can make spiritual gifts, you know, all about us. We even can make worship all about us. You know, we have to say no to songs that are filled with me being the subject or man being the subject. And all the I, me, and my's that are, that are in songs, we have to say no to a lot of those because we can even make worship songs be self-centered. Worship songs. It's just like, it's crazy how, how we can be. But, but the whole point of spiritual gifts is to build up others. That's one of the lessons that you see when you study 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. Paul's trying to get the church of Corinth to understand that it's for the benefit of others, the edification of others, that we are using these gifts. In a sense, you could say, when, you, when I'm talking about something, a gift that I have, you could, in a sense, say that that is your gift because it's not for me, it's for you. So I, I can say that you have the gift of teaching because I'm using a gift of teaching, hopefully, right now, to, and it's something that's yours in the sense of it's for you, it's not for me. Even like we think about like the gift of faith, people use that all the time with saying, God gave me a gift of faith and I was able to believe God for a miracle and all these things. But that's I'm not saying God can't do that, but the main purpose of spiritual gifts is for others. So he can give me a gift of faith to encourage someone else to put their faith in God, for them to believe God, because they're, again, they're for others. Only the gift of tongues really has any dual purpose in the sense of it builds me up, but at the same time, it's used in the lives of others. And I'm not saying that gifts of the Spirit aren't a blessing to us when we use them. Of course they are. But the main purpose of why they're given is to bless others, to put our focus on other people. Again, aligning with God's heart of how disciples are made within the church. God's, God's has set it up to where discipleship happens when we focus on others. And when we all do that, growth happens. So that's why when we all, God want, he knows that, that church has been set up for us to grow. We know that. But it's not intended for us to come and have a self-focus in order to grow. It's intended for us to go and focus on God and focus on others. seems like I've heard these, the greatest commandment and one that's similar to it, to love God with everything and love our neighbors ourselves. seems like that is the, the focus how it should be when we come among God's people. And then indirectly, secondarily, I grow. Not because I'm focused on it, but because I'm focused on God and other people. And as a result, he set things up to where now I grow indirectly. That's what Scripture reveals. 
There's, this is not a gym. I've said this before. This is not a gym where you go for your benefit. You don't really talk to anybody. You just go through the motions and everything. No one's there to encourage you. You just go there. You're on your own. They have a gym here. You can go in the middle of the night at 3 in the morning. My son did that when he's, when he's home. He's at the gym, and then like, 3 in the morning? What are you doing working out at 3? Oh, there's not a lot of people there. Well, yeah, there's a reason. Why? Because you're supposed to be sleeping. I know, but I get my best workout in it early. You know, okay, whatever. It's fine. Do whatever you need to do. You, you do you, pumpkin. But um, I didn't say that. He wouldn't like that. But uh, anyway, so it's like it's not a gym membership. This is not something we come and just focus on ourselves. And I know that for some people that could be shocking because it just makes sense that you come here for you. And God is intending it for you to grow, but not for your focus to be on yourself, for your focus to be on God and others. It's very pervasive throughout the scriptures um, as you study it. So Paul is expressing thankfulness to God that God gave them grace to use these gifts. In fact, he uses the word enrichment. Did you see that in verse 5? That you were enriched in everything. That's the level of blessing they've received by being, by been, have been given these gifts. You know, at one point Paul said, I would that you all speak in tongues, but in the church, I would u- rather use five intelligible words than thousands of words in a tongue. So he's making a distinction. I use tongues in my private personal devotion life, but, I, but at the purpose of it when we come together, it, there has to be an interpreter or else we're not edified because the goal is that all people are edified by the spiritual gifts, not just myself. Now, he also adds in um, verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So this is talking about how God saved them. And this is really getting at the origin of when they started being able to walk in these spiritual gifts or when these spiritual gifts started in them. They received him at salvation. And it doesn't mean that they fully understood those things at salvation. Sometimes we can discover gifts that we have later on after salvation, maybe even years after we learn that I, we have a spiritual gift that we didn't realize. Um, and, and, and so it, it, it happens at salvation, and then we just discover those things. Again, each, he's given at least one spiritual gift to every person, many people, multiple gifts. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. And you can't, again, separate spiritual gifts from how the body is supposed to function. So these Corinthians, I want to mention that they were really immature. Don't you, don't you love being around immature people? It's just, it's just I'm being sarcastic, but it's, it's, it takes, it actually reveals something in us because it, it, when we're around immature people, it, it, we have to be patient. We have to overlook things. We have to tame our tongue. We have to forgive. We have to that can go on the whole long list. And sometimes we can be immature. We can act mature. We can be mature, but then in a moment, because we're not dependent upon the Lord, we can slip up and we can be immature. So it's not like we never have to ever deal with that. But, but most of what Paul wrote in this book to the church of Corinth is corrective in nature. In fact, most of his letters were corrective in nature. We talk about, well, we need to get back and be like the early church. Well, which church? Are you talking about the corrective one that the Paul's always having to correct? Or are you talking about the one that turned the world upside down? Because both were happening at the same time. So, uh, you know, we can have this revisionist history in terms of how great the early church was. They struggled as any Christian would, not having a, a, a multitude of teachers and multitude of, you know, accessibility to God's word and all these things, but the Holy Spirit oversaw every, all those things and compensated supernaturally. Sometimes Christians, well-meaning Christians, who are zealous for spiritual gifts, point to how gifted they are as an evidence of spiritual maturity. And when I see that, I think that they haven't really studied 1 Corinthians <laughs> or, or a lot of the epistles because, again, they're mostly corrective in nature. It's interesting when you think about the church of Corinth and you think about what they were engaged with and what they were doing, the sins that they were engaged in, you, you understand that they pointed to the fact that they were engaged in all these, these gifts and that somehow made them mature. But really, what, what um, the gifts of the Spirit show is that we're open to God's power and God working 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're mature. The fruit of the Spirit is evidence of maturity, not the gifts of the Spirit. Because, again, the Church of Corinth showed that because they were really into spiritual gifts, but they were not very mature. Even at one point, a man was sleeping with his stepmom, and the church actually put up with it. And Paul says that to him, you actually put up with it. And he was shocked that they would do that. So there was a lot of carnality happening. Now, his main request here in verse 7, that they would, they would not come short in any gift as they wait for the rapture is revealed. Look at verse 7. So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says that you come short in no gift. Again, you're saying that to people that are super, super infatuated with gifts. He's not putting, throwing water on them. He's not trying to tamper it down. He's actually trying to stir them up even more, which you would think like, wow, I, I can't even imagine that he would do that. But again, the solution to erroneous practice of gifts is not less gifts. It's more biblical expression of gifts. And that's what he's going to get into in chapter 14 and chapter 12, that we should uh, do things decently and in order. And he talks about how God is not the author of confusion, but things should be done decently and in order. Sometimes we people think that if things are organized and things are in order, that somehow the Holy Spirit isn't moving. Like it has to be crazy and disordered for it to be of the Spirit. You know, I love when people say, when I'm sharing my faith with them, when they say, I'm not into organized religion. I'm like, well, come to our church. It's not really organized. There's some dis disorganization going on. And you'll feel right at home, you know. And I just joke with them, and I'm a goofball, and they rebuke me, and then I move on. But, um, you know, it, it's it's... The Holy Spirit's very much into order, having things done decently and in order. But that doesn't mean that he always works in the way that we expect. How often do we see the Lord Jesus work in a certain way in the Gospels, and you're like, he just did it this way, and then he just turned around the next instance that this thing happened or kind of thing needed to happen, and he worked a totally different way. Why was he doing that? Did he just like variety? Did he just like you know to have things not be the same? It was... He's teaching the disciples he doesn't work the same way every single time. So things were done decently and in order, but they were done in a different way. And they had, they had to learn that. They had to be sensitive to that. And, and that actually, you see that through the, all the scriptures. You see that God didn't do things a certain way that, oh, when he did them the second time and, and, and the third time and the fourth time. And so we have to recognize that, yes, we're going to be, he keeps us in a place of dependence when we don't know how he's going to work. We know he's going to work. We just don't know how he's going to work. But however he chooses to work, it's going to be decent, decently and in order in terms of how he does it. I remember in school, we had to go through and, and record, I forget how many instances, 30 or 40 instances of how God worked in a way that there was order to it, whether the days of creation or, I mean, I mean there was all these different examples um, where we had to show that he worked using order. Just look how he, we've been studying this on Thursday nights with going through the tabernacle and the, and, and the temple and all these things about how he set them up and how they were supposed to tear them down and they were supposed to come in a certain order. And there's so much organization there. Um, but again, the part that they didn't know is when they're going to be moving. They knew how to move out when it was time to move out. They just didn't know when. So there was still dependence upon him, but when there was the time to move, they, it was already prescribed for them in the word exactly how they were to do it, and it was, it was orderly, it was, it was appropriate. You know, the God, look at the creation, look how beautiful the creation is and how everything works perfectly. And, and, and even in the context of how things have been affected by the curse, you know, and, and we live in a fallen world, there's still so much order that we see that he's made and it's just a beautiful thing. So the, so the Holy Spirit's going to lead us to do things differently, but whatever those things are, they're going to be, um, there's going to be an order to it, and it's going to be uh, something that brings glory to God. So that's a beautiful thing that I noticed there. And, and so he gets to this, this whole thing of coming short of no gift. He's, he's trying to encourage them to go deeper into the things of the Spirit and, and, and seek the Lord related to these things. And, and uh, 
a, you know, as I said, it's not the answer isn't no gifts or less gifts. The answer is biblical expression of gifts. So how do we, as 21st century believers in this day and age, how, to, how do we come short in no gift? Because obviously the application for us is he doesn't want us to come short in any gift. Well, it starts with obeying two things, not to be ignorant of spiritual gifts and to desire spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, we're told this, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. I don't know how else he could say it any clearer than that. He doesn't want his people to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. So there's different levels of ignorance. Maybe you say, I'm really, really ignorant. Like, I'll take the prize for being ignorant. I know nothing about spiritual gifts. Zero. I mean, I thought that there was a levitating in the spirit. Uh, and, I, <laughs> and I was wrong. You know, I, that wasn't me. I didn't believe that. But, but I was in some pretty weird stuff as a new Christian. But there's definitely not a levitating in the spirit, just to let you know that. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's definitely, that's not on the list. <laughs> um, but but we're, he doesn't want us to be ignorant. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 reveals, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So he's talking about if you have to choose between tongues, obviously with no interpreter, like he says, has to happen, and prophecy, you should choose prophecy because the whole, again, the whole goal is edification. If people don't understand what you're saying, they can't be edified. If they can't be edified, disciples aren't made. If disciples aren't made, the purpose of the church isn't accomplished. So that's what he's getting at. So it's honestly, if we know this, he doesn't want us to be ignorant, and he, and he tells us to desire spiritual gifts, and we choose not to change related to those things, then we're in disobedience to God's word. And remember, he told them, that these gifts are an expression of enrichment. We saw that. These gifts are expression of being enriched. It's, it's part of being wealthy in the Lord, our spiritual inheritance, having spiritual gifts that we use. As we seek God related to what our gifts are, he will show us what they are, and they were, they're, they're supernatural. They're not just merely human abilities. They're supernatural, even if some appear to be very practical, like the gift of helps. The gift of helps or the gift of ministry seems to be very, very practical. And people with those gifts sometimes feel like they're not walking in a, a supernatural gift. But there's a way to walk in those gifts that is supernatural, being led by when we do it. Being, as we're engaged in those gifts, as we're doing those gifts, be listening to the Holy Spirit and how he wants us to do those gifts in a very specific way. There's all kinds of ways that that can happen. The most practical of the gifts, again, are still supernatural and need to be led by the Holy Spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so once we know what they are, we need to use them. If we don't use them, we're actually in disobedience to God as well. I want to read to you from Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So we're supposed to obey him and use our gifts. He hasn't given us gifts to just to, to, to hide them or to bury them or to, to not be faithful with them. He wants us to do that. But if, again, if we don't know what our gifts are, we need to s discover. How do I know what my gifts are? Should I take one of those, those spiritual gift tests? Have you ever heard of those? How many have taken a spiritual gift test? All right, that's decent. I learned when I took one of those tests that I wasn't called to um, do what those tests said. Uh, or to listen. No, I'm, they have a purpose, I'm not, but there's some really weird ones out there. Uh, and I'm like, where do they get this? It's like, what Bible are they reading? But, um, you know, we're supposed to understand what those gifts are. And some of those, they're describing natural abilities, which I think fails the test. Because the list that he gives are not natural abilities. They're gifts that supernatural ones that he gives us that we have to step out and use. Some of them appear to be more supernatural than others just by their nature, but nevertheless, they're all supernatural. They're all from him, and they're all important. And sometimes we can think that our gift, if it's not something that's more, 
you know, um, bombastic or more like impressive or however you want to describe it. We think it's not as important, but it is. And that's what Paul talks about when he says, can a part of the bone, part of the body say you're not important? We have to understand it's all critically important. There's, especially if you're overseeing a church like I do, it, you realize that every single part of it is so critically important and you appreciate every single person because you're, you're overseeing the whole thing along with other people and you want what's best to hap- happen. And, and the people think, oh, this, this thing is not that important what I'm doing. Oh, no, no, it's so important what you're doing. It's so critically important. There's no one else to do it. And if it, you didn't do it, it wouldn't happen a- a- at the moment. There's lots of things that we are praying about that we need done but we're waiting for God to move on somebody to, have, to demonstrate a heart that they want to do that. But just because you don't see something represented related to someone doing it doesn't mean that we don't have a heart for it or God doesn't have a heart for it. We're not thinking about it or praying about those things. If there's something on your heart, please come forward and let us know. And, and we would be glad to take that all to prayer and can, can, you know, um, consult the overall leadership related to those things. And then he adds that Jesus will confirm them to the end that will, and that they will be blameless. Did you see that? That they, he's going to confirm them. That's such a beautiful expression there, that, that God was going to confirm them to the end, meaning that he's going to sustain them. You know, we're, we're, we're about to, in a, in a, I don't know, a month or two, we'll be in the book of Philippians, Lord willing. In the beginning of that book, he says that God will be faithful to complete the work that he began in the church of Philippi. And, and, and so he will oversee them, he will help them, he will confirm that they really are in the light, they really are um, children of the light, all the way to the end, and, and, and will present, and Paul talks about this, present, I want to present you uh, blameless before the Lord in the end on that, that day when they meet the Lord. One more thing here. Notice he says that they would not come short in a, any gift until the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this is important for us to understand, and, it, and it's connected to the implications of when the gifts cease, or do they cease in this life? And it, it, I believe it's talking about these gifts that he's, he's basically saying this to show them that he, doesn't, he wants them to keep growing in gifts and in their gifts all the way until they meet the Lord and they, they, they experience the Lord at the time of the rapture. Here. So if gifts cease when the Bible is canonized, as some believe, why would the Holy Spirit lead Paul to write these verses? He couldn't write these verses because the gifts wouldn't continue all the way to the rapture. They would cease around the time that the, the Bible was formulated, and so there wouldn't be any way that he could write this. The purpose of the gifts is to build up the body to make disciples, and that need exists all the way to the rapture. That's why in First Corinthians, or, uh, Romans, let me get the right book here. It's the Bible. Uh, no. No. Uh, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4 says, till we all come to the unity of the faith, till we're a, a complete and perfect man. You know, he's talking about how we're mature, like the, the, the leadership gifts and the, and the rest of the body doing their part that it talks about in Ephesians chapter 4. All of that's going to happen till we're a complete, and the body of Christ isn't complete until the day of the rapture there. So we will need this till Jesus comes. And that's why Paul writes later in chapter 13 of this book, the very text people use to try and say the gifts cease, he says there in 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then I shall know just as I am... I also am known. So then I will see face to face. It's not talking about, the, you know, the, when the Bible is formulated and now it's canonized and so we don't need gifts for today. He's talking about when we see Jesus face to face, the very thing that Paul's talking about and that you'll come short in no gift until the revelation of Jesus Christ, until the day where you get caught up to be with Jesus when you're not going to need spiritual gifts anymore. The parallel passage, and it's ironically given as evidence that the gifts don't aren't for today, he says that it'll, it, these things will continue all the way until we see face to face. The Bible being canonized, the Bible doesn't have a face. I'm talking about Jesus, when we see Jesus face to face, it's a beautiful thing. Now Paul ends in verse 9 by speaking of God's faithfulness to do all this. Look at verse 9. 
God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So it's amazing that God was faithful to call us into the fellowship of his son. The word fellowship means koinonia. It's the Greek word koinonia, and it means to share. It means to partake. It means to share with something, someone something critically important. We fellowship with one another, meaning that we share the themes of Scripture, the truth of Scripture, when we talk to, pe- to one another. And God spiritually builds us up when we do that. That's why when we're talking about the themes of the Lord, not the 49ers, as much as I love the 49ers, we're not engaged in koinonia until we're talking about the Lord and things of the Lord, and then we're spiritually built up. And it's, it's amazing how that happens. I don't understand how it happens. I just know we're spiritually built up when we're engaged in fellowship. But he's saying here that by him, by Jesus, you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We have that intimate, personal relationship with Jesus, which none of us would trade for anything. It's so amazing to have that, that, that intimacy. I was with some friends Friday night praying, and the presence of the Lord was so strong in that room. It was such a blessing. All of us were so, uh, you know, it was obvious to all of us that he was present in that room. It was a beautiful thing. There's nothing like that. The world can't even dream of experiencing something like that. They don't know nothing of that. And it's it's such a precious thing that we get to enjoy all the time. So this is a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed. He was thankful and he prayed for this church and everything. Obviously things that we can appreciate, we can learn from. And, and he does want us to be thankful for spiritual gifts in the sense that he wants to use us in one another's lives. It would be horrible if, if we, did, we got saved and then he never used us the whole rest of our existence. That would be horrible. But he lets us be a part of what he's doing. He doesn't need us, but he wants us. Much like when you're working on something and your your small little son comes alongside and and he helps you, he's not really adding value uh, there like like someone that was super qualified and knows what they're doing. But the fact is it's your son. You want your son to be with you and be a part of what you're doing. It's so much like that. God doesn't need us, but he wants us. And he loves the fact that he can use us. And it's such a blessing to be used I would just encourage us to continue to desire. Remember, he says to desire spiritual gifts. Well, he's not only having that in his word because he wants us to desire to be used by him because that's why gifts are given, so that God can use us. That's what he wants. And that's such a blessing to be used. If you're not being used by the Lord right now, you know whether or not you're being used by the Lord or you're not being used by the Lord enough. Pray and ask God to use you. Talk to me. Talk to Pastor Mike. Talk to one of the leaders. I want God to use me more. We're praying and waiting for God to raise up people to, to serve. It'd be, a, it'd be a great thing if we kind of matched up those desires together, and, and that's how God builds us up. That's how he makes disciples, and it's a beautiful thing how we set things up. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for using us. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for how beautiful it is when we step out and start being used by you, how beautiful it is to you. No one is more blessed than you when we step out and are used. And I pray, Lord, that for any here that don't know what their spiritual gift is, I pray that you'd reveal it to them. In your timing, Lord, in your way, however you choose to do it, I pray you'd reveal what their gift is or gifts and that you would show them how they can serve your people and be aligned with how you set up the church in terms of what it's supposed to do. And I pray that you would help us to help them be able to do that well. Thank you for all who serve in this church. Thank you for all all the people that sacrifice for your body. Lord, it blesses you so much when we bless your people. So we just pray that you would lead us, reveal things to us, encourage us. Lord, I pray you would bless those that are serving and they're serving to exhaustion. Bless them for that. Refill them, Lord, with your spirit. Encourage them that they are They are appreciated, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.